Zinniop's here to school you, so bow to your sensei. I'll giggity Lois and make new videos every Wednesday. You know how in English you can say, I see the owl, but the owl sees me? Imagine if it was like that for every noun, and there were way more different forms. That's just declensions. We haven't even touched on verbs. So, Russian is an example language I am relatively familiar with. Russian has six cases. The nominative for subjects, accusative for objects, genitive for of, dative for to, instrumental for with, and prepositional for general locations. But Proto-Indo-European had eight noun cases. So, where are they? Well, Russian kind of has the locative case in the sense that some words like floor and garden, where you would expect the prepositional napolie or nasadie, actually have an inflected ending of a stressed u, which is descended from the historic locative case. It's also often listed as the locative, while the ye ending is the prepositional, even though people don't really use that, probably because it would mess with their beloved stress patterns. But call me when they change the name Tarastov na Donye. Anyway, there's also the vocative case, which only affects names that decline feminine, and no one missed the vocative anyways, but the ablative! My boy, what have they done to you? Good night, my sweet prince. There'll be peace when you are done. Also, they added in the prepositional. That one was innovated. But... Why doesn't English? None of the surviving Germanic languages use cases except for genitive. We have word order. What would it look like if we did? Well, um, unfortunately, we can immediately see why they lost it. The typical masculine noun endings for nominative and accusative in Proto-Indo-European were os and om. In Proto-Germanic, this M changed into an N, the vowels O and A started being the same vowel, the N disappeared and nasalized this A, and S was voiced as Z according to Werner's Law. That's Proto-Germanic. Then in Proto-West Germanic, they spirantized the nasal and the final Z was lost, and then both of these A's brightened into ash, which then dropped off. Do you see the issue? But for a number of reasons, we can't be deterred by that. For one thing, in Russian, the accusative and nominative are already the same for inanimate nouns, so it's not that big a deal. And there are still other cases that were lost for no good reason. So let's check them out. Where are our example words? We should probably start with something that is relatively simple, the aforementioned os ending. A fine example word is quelos, which produces whale in English. Inflected forms would be os, om, e, osio, ead, oi, e, and o. But we also need plurals. These are os, oms, os, ohom, opos, omos, oisu, and ois. Let's head to Proto-Germanic. Now, there are a lot of rules, but only a few of them actually matter. Starting with the loss of laryngeals, we lose laryngeals, and we lengthen a vowel that came before. Then, we combine two vowels into a single long vowel. Next is the loss of word final non high vowels, where we lose word final vowels that aren't high. Grimm's Law messes with all of the plosives, which there are only two of. Werner's Law is a lot more impactful. It voices every S into a Z, including the ones with the sonar and insulating the word. Hopefully, some of those will survive. I doubt it, though. Every short E becomes an I, and A contracts into E. Every O becomes an A. Next up, M turns into N at the end of a word. That's why they call it the end and not the M. M do ways that N turns into a nasalization for the genitive, plural, and accusative endings. The T at the end of ablative singular is gone. Every long A raises back into an O. Also, ya is now spelt with a J or an I, for the sake of consistency. And we made it to Proto-Germanic. The bad news is that so did Hualar. So, now we have to compare to reality. Overall, it's not horrible. Proto-Germanic lost the ablative and locative cases, but the nominative, accusative, vocative, and instrumental singulars are spot on. And so are all plurals except instrumental. What went wrong with dative and genitive singulars? Well, the genitive would have become the same as the nominative, but that obviously won't do. You need those two to remain separate. So... I think what happened here is that while this word is an unstressed os, there were also stressed os, which wouldn't have been affected by Werner's law. For the sake of simplicity, they merged the two, and for the sake of complexity, they made the stressed version into the genitive. The dative singular is harder to justify. Both nominative, plural, and dative singular have a hiatus of oe. In the nominative singular, this is contracted, and we get os instead of eyes. In the dative, we don't contract, and the short A doesn't raise. Maybe this is because of the semivowel, and the instrumental plural was just a little bit off. 
I think what happened here is that instead of using ois, they copied an analogous e-stem, which has emis as the instrumental plural, making it omis, which would in fact give us amish. Now that everyone's ready, we can move down into Old English. In the final syllable of a three-syllable word, the final vowel is deleted. Assuming the root is a single syllable, that kills any two-syllable ending. That makes the dative, instrumental, and accusative plurals all dangerously similar, so be careful. Next up is umlaut. That doesn't affect any of these endings, but we do need to add a note that the locative singular would force the root it's attached to to umlaut. Now, all the final long vowels shorten, and the diphthong in the locative plural ending changes into a long vowel. And loss of word final z. Oopsie, like I said, I wasn't optimistic about them staying. Since the b in the ablative plural was intervocalic, it becomes a fa. Next up, the ingbionic nasal spirant law kills the nasalization in the genitive plural, but not the accusative singular. All the A's brighten into ash, and then word final open vowels are lost. So, welcome to Proto-West Germanic. Who's not dead? Well, not the vocative, but it's the same as the nominative. Other than that, almost nothing is okay now. For starters, the nominative swapped over to an S ending. Fine, we know how plurals work in English. Secondly, instrumental plural is um instead of am, presumably to match the singular. Again, I think that's a good idea. Then the dative plural did it too, why not take the opportunity to separate them? So you know what? If we're allowed to make small, reasonable changes, I'd like to make some too. We keep the dative instrumental changes. Other than that, the locative plural and dative singular are the same, so we can do the same trick and let the plural keep the S. Also, the ablative, which the whole point of this video was to rescue, is on collision course with the nominative. How to solve this? Well, let's do the instrumental plural method. In an E stem, the genitive and ablative are the same. So I'm going to copy-paste the genitive, but with a different vowel. That makes it is with a note to umlaut the previous vowel. Finally, accusative plural become a long A. I really can't find a way to justify this. The most obvious is that the nasal spirant law removed the nasal and lengthened the A, but the Z would have been lost before that, and also the other root very obviously didn't. I guess the only way to justify this is that maybe the nasal just did that. Whatever. As we go into Old English, we reach a bunch of vowel harmony-related sound changes, so I have to know what kind of vowel was when so I can affect the preceding vowel accurately. This is kind of important, because A and E from O and E merge into E in an unstressed final syllable, and if we're being completely honest, all of these unstressed vowels are going to disappear or become schwa depending on phonotactics, so let's just skip to modern English. Nominative and accusative whale, genitive whales, ablative wheels, dative whaley with an e, locative wheel, instrumental wall, plurals, nominative walus, accusative whaley with an a, genitive walu, ablative whalef, dative whalm, locative whaleys, instrumental walm. So, you could say, I walm killed that guy instead of I kill that guy using multiple whales. That would save so much time. Why isn't this already a thing? Now over to the feminine endings. These are basically the same as the masculine. The major difference being that they use E instead of O or A. And the genitive plural is a little extra. The foremost ramification of this is that all the endings are suddenly more similar and they all loom out. So if whale was a feminine noun, its endings would be nominative and vocative and accusative and locative wheel, genitive and ablative wheels, dative and instrumental and accusative plural, wheel I for plurals, nominative, vocative, and locative, wheel I's, genitive, wheel U, ablative, wheel F, and dative and instrumental, wheel M. Well, that took up more time than I was expecting, so we're not going to have time to explain if we want to do verb inflections, which we do want. Yes, nod your head. Yeah, so we'll go with throw. This is descended from the thematic verb tre. Now, Am I really going to list off every single inflection a verb can possibly have? No, of course not. We just need the infinitive, every person we can have in the present and past, indicative, subjunctive, and imperative. We're basically only using the same rules, get rid of laryngeals, Grimm's Law, Werner's Law, replace all of the E's with I's and all of the O's with A's, and then back into O's when long, and turn M into nasalization. The simple system absolutely nails the indicative presence. It also absolutely bombs the subjunctive, because apparently the Germanic subjunctive is descended from the historic optative moot. Once we fix the input, the output is passable, everything is slightly off, and for the sake of consistency and not messing up the past tense, I'm gonna keep it with my version. The imperatives are surprisingly perfectly accurate, and the past doesn't have anything to compare against, so that means nothing can be wrong. I love linguistics. However, the past and present do have to be significantly different from each other, so I'm going to turn off Werner's Law for the past tense. There's probably some stressed aorist I can by analogy it to. Rather than being dropped off, the R in the third person singular becomes a R. 
when the third syllable of vowels dropped off, an S is added to the third person past plural. The ingbionic nasal spiral law actually has a much more significant effect, separating the third person plurals affected by Werner's law from those not. Now, by Proto-West Germanic, the E in throw was an A for reasons. We don't have much to compare, but at least the indicative forms look similar. Anywho's, then Old English made up its own set of inflections, and they even brought back ablaut, and now we say through as a past tense. But enough about that. Umlaut and vowel backing are noted, and all the short vowels disappear or turn into schwa. That leaves the following 23 forms. The infinitive is, of course, thrown. A summary knowledge of Germanic should net you that much. Next up, the indicatives. We have I throw, you threw, or he throwed, we throw, you throwed, and we throned. Now, now, since we are doing alternate universe linguistics, why not just use thou and you? Because this is only about inflected forms, not making up new lemmas. Besides, the verb inflections are the same anyways. Next up, the past indicatives. We have I throw, you throughs, she throweth, we throweth, you throweth, they throweth. The imperatives are throw and throwed. Finally, the subjunctive forms are I throwy with an A, you throwy with an E, it throweth, we throweth, you throweth, they throweth. Isn't that much nicer?